Before we get into this week's episode, we have a really exciting announcement to make. Spike's incredible internship program is back. We're on the lookout for an aspiring journalist to join our team for a six-month paid full-time placement. You'd be working with us here in the Spiked office, doing everything from helping us put out our articles to helping us produce podcasts like this one. And you don't need any prior experience to apply. What we're looking for is someone who has a spark for journalism, writing or podcasting, and who has a passion for our pro-freedom, pro-human message. Everything else you can learn on the job. I started at Spiked as an intern, so I can highly recommend applying for this. It's an amazing experience and you get to earn while doing something you love. There really is nowhere better to kickstart your career in journalism. To find out more and to apply, go to spike-online.com slash interns. That's spike-online.com slash interns. You have until Sunday the 19th of May to apply. Good luck. Hello and welcome back to the Spiked podcast. I'm Lauren Smith, sitting in for Fraser this week. Joining me in the studio today is Spiked's editor, Tom Slater. Hello. And Telegraph columnist, Madeleine Grant. Hi. Hey. Coming up on today's show, Scotland's farcical hate crime act, the West's growing abandonment of Israel, and the callousness of assisted dying. So, Scotland's Hate Crime and Public Order Act has come into effect this week. Um, Very fittingly, this happened on April 1st, and it has turned out to be a complete joke, essentially. (laughs) Um, So, this we've we've talked about this a lot on Spiked Mm -hmm. um, and how sort of vague and tyrannical this piece of legislation is. Um, And as it turns out, we've seen uh, Police Scotland receiving record numbers of uh, hate crime reports. I think it was something like 3,800 reports of hate crimes. That was just within the first 24 hours. So that's around 60 hate crimes per hour. Sounds about um, <laughs> <laughs> So <Exactly>. few. <laughs> uh, and as it turns out, one such supposed hate criminal is even um, Humza Yousaf, the first minister of Scotland himself, who is apparently being reported en masse for a speech he made in 2020, um, where he railed against Scotland being too white. Um, J.K. Rowling, of course, being reported um, for misgendering and um, other anti-trans crimes. But uh, Madeline, what have you made of this? Uh, Was it always doomed to be so farcical from the start? Uh, yeah, I, I think it was. I mean, I think when you, for example, in in Scotland, I think there's something like 16,000 police officers in Police Scotland. Um, if you give a police force that number of fake non-crimes to investigate mm. day after day, I mean, that's that's inevitably going to paralyze any kind of of um, lawmaking or not l- lawmaking rather any kind of well protection that they're doing going about their daily life and business. I mean, I just don't know why any government would be stupid enough to create a rule that would basically take the permanently offended online people and give them sort of legal capacity to pursue their, you know, insane rabbit holes, um, potentially with the muscle of the state behind it. I mean, I just think that it was always a terrible idea. Um, And I also have to, you have to question, well, you know, what would compel a government to do something like this? You know, it tells you something extraordinary about where they think that the the limit of the state's power is basically that there's no limit that it can encroach into your dinner table conversations, mm. into your living rooms, and even to encourage children to kind of dob in their parents, like the kind of thing that happened in in, the so- in Soviet Russia. Uh, you know, so I think it's I welcome the backlash, but I also think that you know the fact that it had to come to this um, suggests that we're in a very very bad place indeed. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. I think also the fact that it had to come to the intervention of a beloved children's author to clarify whether or not legally speaking you would be locked up for misgendering someone again shows how ridiculous all of this has become i actually thought the response to that was also interesting so you had a lot of the kind of legal twitter pedants saying well this proves doesn't it that there's nothing to worry about with this law to begin with but it's exactly what you say madeline as far as a big problem with these laws is not what is in the black and white of the legislation. Mm. It's how the police interpret it. I mean, the police have famously only had two hours online training on this particular piece of legislation. And we've seen across the UK in recent years, them continuously harass, arrest. Mm. In some cases, it's even got as far as convictions for people who have engaged in supposedly transphobic speech online or misgendered people. That's happened under UK-wide statute. And then it takes for an appeals court for anyone to realise that actually this shouldn't have been taken this far. So every extra sort of layer of legislation you have is more of an incentive to go after people and more of an incentive for trans activists in particular who have been very willing. It's been a concerted tactic on their part to weaponize complaints of hate crime and hate speech 
against people who disagree with them. I mean, sometimes you see one trans activist at the heart of several different complaints against several different prominent gender critical people. This was always bound to happen. Um, but I, I do I do worry on, on the flip side of it, though, that but the discussion became purely about whether or not it's acceptable to be a gender critical feminist in Scotland. Yes. Whereas the kind of underlying point of whether or not the state should be legislating against stirring up hatred at all, whatever that means, that's kind of been lost a little bit. And also sometimes I think when there is an absurd piece of legislation like this, the instinct is to laugh because it's very easy to laugh yeah. at it. It's utterly ridiculous. But sometimes if we turn it into a kind of a meme or a joke, we forget the serious side the very authoritarian mentality that must exist in people for this to have been allowed to enter the statute books. And actually the very large number of politicians, um, not just the SNP, who, who actually support this. No, absolutely. And you do definitely sort of get the impression that the politicians and lawmakers involved in this sort of don't really have a good sense of the conclusions of the laws that they're actually making. Um, you know, you have... Um, the, the Scottish minister in, in charge of the rollout for this law saying, oh, well, I think it might be a crime to misgender and then actually rolling that back and saying, no, it's it's not a crime. Yeah, so it really does seem in a lot of ways that they have no idea what they're talking about, right? Which is often the case. As well. <laughs> I mean, the number of times you see a kind of viral video, either in this case of, you know, Scottish ministers unable to say whether or not their own piece of legislation, which they've been working on for years, whether or not it will lead gender critical feminists to be locked up. They can't answer those questions. I've always been fascinated by kind of the, way, the extent to which Police officers, in the process of arresting someone, don't know what the law is. Even yes. you know, people having it almost explained to them as they're being carted away. So what it is they've potentially done? And this is something which, again, should be a warning against adding to the already significant weight of speech crime and legislation that mm. we already have, because they have absolutely no idea what it is that they're talking about. I mean, I think your average policeman across the UK seems to have got it into their head because of a lot of ridiculous training sessions that have been given by Stonewall or other places, that just being mean to people on the internet is a potential criminal offence. Yeah. Um, and they will happily use that either as a, either to go after people who've been complained about en masse um, or because someone's a troublemaker and uh, or someone's a bit of a troublemaker and they want to be seen to be good and seem to, and want to get a little bit of positive PR out of it. So it's it's really, really dangerous. But again, these laws are just being made almost as a giant virtue signal and we'll mm. work out the consequences later. That seemed to be a, a quintessential example of this in the Hate Crime Act, definitely. But I really mm. think that we ought to have learned something from what happened to our police forces during lockdown, which was often they were given extremely complicated and ever-changing rules to follow without often, you know, basically policy making on the hoof without any debate in parliament. And then they were basically given the authority to try and implement these rules. And it would sometimes result in um, insane behavior, either a correct application of the law or an incorrect application based on, you know, a misunderstanding, but it's still very easily done. Um, and I don't know why you would deliberately seek to overburden police officers with yet more things that they have to interpret and, and think about that relate to, well, hurty words, basically, when there are, you know, plenty of burglaries that need dealing with and plenty of minor thefts that aren't even, aren't even pursued. And, you know, who, who wants this is the other question. I mean, yeah. has there been a, a great demand in the Scottish general public and indeed in the rest of the UK for this these kinds of actions. I think if you ask most people, they would say, I'd rather the police were, you know, doing what the police traditionally mm -hmm. do. No, absolutely. And it was fascinating, wasn't it? And unintentionally hilarious that you had this announcement when they were rolling out the law saying, we're going to investigate every single complaint which is made to us. And this came, I think, mere weeks after they made this very widely criticised statement, Police Scotland, where they said they're going to take a proportionate response <laughs> to various other crimes. Because like anywhere else, you've got burglary spiralling, no one doing anything about it and all, all the rest of it. So you had that. But in terms of that question of you know who wants this, it has been quite clear that trans activists in particular have seen state censorship as like their greatest ally. They've pursued it very fervently. It was interesting to see in the wake of Police Scotland announcing that, no, we're not going to arrest JK Rowling. You saw one prominent trans activist, one of these people who, despite being a man, is a UN women's ambassador, um, saying how upset he was that <laughs> JK Rowling wasn't going to be arrested. I think the exact <laughs> quote was, this is a law against bullying and JK Rowling is a bully. So it was a perfect kind of example of, yeah. um, despite all the kind of legal pedantry after the fact with this law, everyone knew what it was supposed to do. Everyone knew mm. the context in which it in which it appeared. And it was very much because of the fact that not just trans activists, but kind of identity politics in general, is obsessed with shutting people up. It does see censorship as like the, what is between us and utopia. 
basically. Yeah. And this is, a, I guess, an outgrowth of that. But also perhaps there's a bit of the old rage, rage against the dying of the light, mm. because I think there has been a sea change in public behaviour. You know, a few years ago, most people just wanted to do what was kind and nice and... I think there was a sense that the kind of nice thing is to is to to go to go along with um, affirming people in their gender, whatever that may be. But as we've learned more about, for example, the closure of the Tavistock Clinic, there have been all these developments. There's been some fantastic forensic journalism into what's really going on here mm. and the danger, and also just how little we know about this, which is a very un- unexplored area of, of science. Um, you know, I think that there has been a, a sea change and it certainly has not in public opinion. It certainly, I don't think the trans activists have always been um, their, their own best friend when it comes to this. You know, they've often been, as Tom was saying, like in- incredibly aggressive and resorting to these intimidatory tactics because they actually have failed to win the argument in the public sphere. But this isn't also just a problem for Scotland, right? Like we sort of um, make fun of or poke fun at the um, insanity of the Scottish Hate Crime Act. But we have plenty of our own laws that also mean that gender critical women are being, in some cases, carted away in handcuffs. I mean, a lot of the time they're not arrested. I'm sorry, they're not charged, but they are arrested. And that's kind of all that needs to happen. And these are happening under laws that already exist in the UK. They already apply to all of the UK, including Scotland. And like, isn't that a problem too? Shouldn't we also be kind of re-examining, now that we have this example of Scotland taking things to the absolute extreme, Mm -hmm. shouldn't we now also be examining the current laws that we have here? No, definitely. And it's, it's even got as far as convictions in some cases. So there was Kate Scotto, who was a radical feminist, spent a lot of time on social media arguing with trans activists. She was arrested in front of her children, held in a prison cell for seven hours, and then eventually convicted of a, essentially a form of harassment for misgendering and being mean to a, to a trans activist who was being quite mean in return, I think it's fair to say. She was eventually convicted. Again, it was only overturned on appeal. There was a case um, later on from that, which was a sort of Christian spree a Christian street preacher from Leeds who confronted a kind of trans individual on the street or they confronted them. And through this exchange, he referred to this male individual as a a gentleman. Uh, It was all captured on camera. He ends up going to court. He again was convicted and it had to be eventually overturned. So even in, these these are both in England. This is way before the Hate Crime Act becomes law in Scotland even. And you still have situations in which existing law is being used in this way. And it's because of the fact that when you're talking about speech crime, aside from how intolerant and liberal and counterproductive it is even to challenge the speech you claim you want to challenge and so on, it's also really subjective. It's also really open to abuse. It's really open to interpretation. What is one man stirring up hate is another person who's yeah. very passionate campaigning against a great social ill. So it's a, it's a reminder of why we need to just get out the business of policing speech full stop, not just again, enjoy the um, ridiculousness of what's going on north of the border. It's really hard to police one kind of speech when history tells us this. It's like a, everything is very intertwined. It's, it's, you kind of can't push down on one area of speech without inadvertently taking mm. loads of other mm-hmm. things. And there's often unintended consequences that, that nobody could have foreseen, or at least some people might have foreseen, but certainly the people who were enacting it didn't foresee. Um, but I just, I don't think our politicians ever learn really I mean it seems to me that we have a state which is you know when we fail in the most basic functions often and people feel exceptionally highly taxed you'd think that you know there's got to be a market for a politician who says actually we're going to stop spending money on doing all of these (laughs) non-useful non-popular things and stick to doing the bread and butter of a functioning state I mean I would personally vote for anyone who said we're just not going to be involved in half of these things you know do we need a women and equalities um you know, whole department of government. Most people just want, you know, the trains to run and the and it, the hospitals to be va- vaguely functioning, and also the police to turn up when there's a a crime. You know, yeah. it's not it's not rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> Did either of you see the um the video that was put out when they were advertising? Oh, the hate the, monster. The hate monster. Because yeah. I that made I only actually came across it today when I was thinking about this podcast. I couldn't believe I missed it because it's extraordinary. And it actually really reminded me of lockdown in a big way because it was that weird mixture of like deeply authoritarian and sinister with also this awful tweeness. Mm. Mm. You know sort what of play I mean? days aesthetic on top. So it's yeah. like, don't, don't let the hate monster <laughs> win. Um, you know, it's incredibly patronizing to, to grown adults, you know. Yeah. The idea that it's, it's like being told a fairy story by the government <laughs> about sentient adults. 
Yeah. The only thing stopping most adults from committing a hate crime is a fuzzy <laughs> cartoon monster, apparently. So <laughs> Exactly. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is a bit like using noise-cancelling headphones during the in-flight safety demonstration. Sure, we've all done it, and it'll probably turn out fine. But what if one day that scary-looking oxygen mask drops from the ceiling and you have no idea what to do with it? It's always better to be safe than sorry. That's why I use ExpressVPN to safely browse the web. You might think you're being careful when it comes to not sharing your private info online, but it's unbelievably easy for someone to access your data, especially if you regularly use free Wi-Fi at cafes and hotels. Hacking your devices is so simple that a smart 12-year-old could do it. And I mean, why wouldn't they? These hackers can make close to £1,000 selling your info on the dark web. When ExpressVPN says it'll keep you safe online, it really means it. Whenever you connect to Wi-Fi, ExpressVPN sends all your data through an encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet. This means that no hackers can steal your info, even when you're using public Wi-Fi. In fact, it would take an expert hacker with a supercomputer over a billion years to breach ExpressVPN's encryption. This might all sound pretty complicated, but don't worry. ExpressVPN is incredibly easy to use. All you need to do is open the app, press one button, and you're protected. And it works on all devices, including phones, laptops, and tablets, so you can stay protected wherever you are. My favorite thing about ExpressVPN is that I can actually use it to watch TV shows and movies that aren't normally available in my country. That means I can make the most out of streaming services and really get my money's worth. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com spiked. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash spiked. And you can get an extra three months free expressvpn.com slash spiked. So the other big story this week has been out of the Gaza conflict and it revolves around this um, very tragic event where um, seven aid workers were killed in a aid convoy. So it seems like this was an accident that the IDF um, unintentionally ended up targeting this convoy. Um, Like I said, seven people were killed. Three of them were British citizens. Um, And it seems like this is now being used as a kind of pretext for a lot of Western leaders to sort of take a step back away from the conflict and to kind of roll back their support of Israel. Um, The Israeli government has apologized. The uh, IDF chief has also apologized, um, you know, promising that they will thoroughly investigate this and find out why it happened. But uh, this doesn't seem like it's going to be enough to sort of convince Mm -hmm. the West or parts of the West, at least that um, you know, Israel is still worth defending. What have you made of this, Tom? Uh, as is so often the case in this conflict, sort of um, really unsettled by the event itself and then also really unsettled and confused by the reaction. So, of course, what took place in Gaza on Monday, it's such a tremendous tragedy, such a unnecessary thing to happen. I mean, its investigations are going to be ongoing, but it does seem to be just a horrendous mistake at this point. Um, there's going to be questions to answer, heads will roll, I'm sure, over what appears to be an act, somewhere between an act of negligence or just an act of, um, as I say, something which um, no one is obviously going to support. And also that it's worth saying that the IDF were relatively quick in taking responsibility mm. for it. Mm. Um, and that's certainly something which you wouldn't see on the other side, shall we say. But um, what's been interesting, first of all, you've got all the usual suspects who naturally have been very quick to say, well, this is Israel doing what Israel does. And anything like this just gets folded into that narrative of not only just that they're reckless, but that they're kind of bloodthirsty. That's kind of like the implication. They have such a low concern for civilian life that, of course, they're going to go and mm. bomb a few aid workers. That is kind of to be expected. But as Daniel ben wrote on the site this week, it is really ugly and it's a kind of recurring almost refashioned blood libel that happens in response to either cases of civilian casualties more broadly or something like this which is just presented as that's what they're like isn't it um and that's something which is really unseemly but as you're suggesting in your intro there it's also had this knock-on effect with western leaders more broadly and it's become a kind of prompt for them to express their own hesitancy about supporting israel the kind of sense that this has gone on long enough And it just doesn't really follow to me that you have something like this, a horrendous accident takes place and it should call into question your support for a state defending itself against a genocidal threat. I mean, that's even if even if you've had long running concerns about how much care they're taking in the prosecution of this war, um, the levels of accountability when things go wrong. It it doesn't follow to me that that should prompt this kind of soul searching. I think the only reason that it does is because there is this now lack of 
resolve, this kind of nervousness on the part of Western leaders. You almost feel like they're looking for anything like this as a prompt to start to take some cautious steps backwards. And, and it's hard to work out whether that is just a kind of a, a level of their own kind of war weariness and sort of moral cowardice in relation to this conflict, or the fact that they have start to Im started to imbibe some of these narratives, which is that even though that they've all kind of forgotten about October 7th and this is just Israeli warmongering and bloodlust playing itself out again. So yes, horrendous thing that takes place, but it's, it, I struggle to understand why we've had the kind of level of soul searching that's followed. Well, I think it's important to distinguish between criticism that is fair and legitimate. Um, and it's, I think it's, I, I just despise this idea that because Israel is our ally and because what happened on October the 7th was, you know, one of the most vile acts of inhumanity that that has that is hard, hard to think of anything worse, really. Um, but also that you kind of, it's not, you can't really criticise mm. what Israel is doing. I think it's very, very important, not least if you're a friend of Israel, if you if you want Israel to succeed, um, that, you know, there are times, there are many things that, that we should, we can and should criticise. Um, a a long-standing criticism has been that they have um, not been operating with enough concern for collateral damage on the ground. Um, and I think that this is a very vivid example that illustrates that. Um, you know, the convoy was clearly marked. Um, they had reportedly telegraphed their whereabouts with, with, with our army officials ahead of time. And they were repeatedly attacked with this drone. Um, this suggests to me, I mean, I'm not an expert and I'm, I'm definitely, an, I don't want to be like an armchair general, but it suggests that there was at least a real, there was a real absence of coordination between whoever was operating the drone and um, whoever, whoever the, the aid convoy had, had spoken to. You know, this is important stuff. This is the death of, of three British nationals and other people from the, the globe, the world community, should we say. Um, and I, you know, I think, you know, of course, of course, I, I don't think this is one of those things where we should just say, well, they've so said sorry, so it's fine. Um, you know, it doesn't, it does need to be investigated. Um, uh, and I, you know, I, I do think that Tom's point about Western leaders sort of turning away a little is an important one. I mean, David Cameron, for example, is noticeably less warm towards Israel than, than, than was his predecessor. But also um, Donald Trump gave an interview a few days ago, I think, where he basically said that the war needs to end now. Um, so it's not necessarily coming from people who are you know, hostile to Israel. Uh, I think it's notable also the fact that they've had to attack the Al-Shiva hospital. Um, I'm not talking so much about the morality of this, but the fact that they have had to go off to the Al-Shifa hospital just months after they supposedly cleared it suggests that the strategy of basically bombardment isn't working. You know, it's they've had to go back and take this hospital having having taken it already. I mean, you know, these are legitimate questions. What is the strategy and what is the what is the end point? I, th I think that, again, it's a case of sort of making distinctions, though, to a certain yeah. extent, because absolutely in terms of people should be well within their rights whether it's in the West, whether it's in Israel, whatever, to call into question the way in which this war is being prosecuted, how people are acting, what concerns are being taken for civilian life, collateral damage, all these different things are really important. It just feels like there's a kind of another discussion going on, which is to suggest that whether it's people in the media or Western leaders are almost waiting for the proof that this was somehow an illegitimate exercise to begin with, that there's this yeah. kind of undertone of, oh, it's gone far enough now, that there's a kind of forgetting about the fact that whilst we could question the wisdom of this particular tactic or this particular method of um, war or whatever it might be, that um, the reason that they are at war in the first place and the fact that Israel quite rightly feels that it cannot coexist with a genocidal threat on its border has kind of evaporated from Western discussion to a large yes. extent. And that's the thing I find quite unsettling. And there's, there's just a, a, a lack of understanding of that that being the particular prompt. And even amongst kind of otherwise friends or allies of Israel, whether we're talking about individuals or particular nations. I think the further we get away from October 7th, the very, it's been very easy for them to forget about it because of the fact that the narrative has been so set from the off that this was, that even though October 7th was, a hor was horrible, this war is an overreaction, that, you know, you now hear kind of 
the pro-Palestine set talking about October 7th as if people just took a few hostages that day. Absolutely. There is this yeah. rewriting of history. And I do worry, I do wonder, and I do worry that there's, if there's a, um, a section of the kind of Western ruling class, which are starting to succumb to that narrative to a certain extent um, and are failing to recognise the kind of stakes in this conflict, not just for Israel itself, but for the fight against this kind of new genocidal anti-Semitic Islamism and the way in which it menaces people, not just in Israel, but across the world, really. So I just feel like there's, there's been a, a lack of perspective and a, yeah. n a, a creeping kind of moral cowardice which has shown itself in the course of the past week. It definitely feels almost as if, you know, um, you don't necessarily have those measured voices. I mean, obviously they do exist, but um, the, the people that really come to the forefront in this discussion are not the people saying, we need to criticize Israel because of this horrendous mistake that's happened or this horrendous act of negligence as it may be. Um, it, it almost feels as if Israel sort of doesn't get the right to be treated like any other state purely because, you know, so many of the um, people talking about this have immediately jumped not to this was an accident, but to this was a deliberate attack um, because Israel in their eyes is sort of this uniquely inherently evil uh, force that is out to, you know, cause as much destruction and horror as possible. Um, so there is a real sort of, you know, hypocrisy here, don't you think, about the way that we um, criticize Israel versus the way that we would maybe treat any other state that has committed, you know, horrific acts during wartime. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do agree. And although I, I have noticed that um, what is sometimes said when when someone criticizes, let's say, um, people come up with a list of examples of when Western governments have done something similar, mm -hmm. which is very legitimate. It's a perfectly good point. However, some of these, for example, um, a common um, counterpoint is, well, look how the US reacted after 9-11, to which it does slightly, it does raise the point of, well, was that a good idea? Mm -hmm. Did that go well? Um, you know, I, th I think if you're if you're a friend of Israel, and, and in fact, there are many, many people within Israel who themselves are highly critical of what Netanyahu is doing. And and also the fact that his, his premiership basically now does hinge on continued mm -hmm. military action. You know, there are these interesting internal dynamics that, that are, I think, I think very relevant, but what I absolutely abhor is, I think both of you have made this point that it's it's like there's almost a sense of that um, that almost all Jewish people are responsible for anything that happens, um, and of Israel being held to a very different standard than that applied to other countries. There was this furore on social media where the actress Samantha Bond uh, said to the Jewish actress Tracy Ann Oberman, um, "What do you have to say about the seven aid workers dead?" As if, you know, a, a Jewish woman living in the UK is somehow collectively responsible for, um, you know, a potentially, well, um, you know, manslaughter and accidental killing in, you know, in, in, in the Gaza Strip. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing. And I think on that point of, um, again, you don't want, you know, you can point out double standards all day long, but that doesn't necessarily mean that both examples are good and proper. Mm. I completely agree with that. What is going on? here is not necessarily a reason to again kind of create a new standard on that basis but if anything i think the double standards are a little bit deeper than that insofar as people seem to struggle to understand why israel is at war in the first place mm -hmm. like they, they seem to struggle to understand that they have any justification whatsoever for wanting to degrade or destroy hamas i mean i um give him a lot more allowances here because he's obviously intimately emotionally involved but the head of the particular charity or ngo um whose um, convoy was hit on monday i mean he said not only were they deliberately attacked and he said that very explicitly time and time again but also that he described the conflict at this point as Israel's war against humanity and that is a quite common claim there is a airbrushing of October 7th out of the picture there's a willful naivety of what Hamas is and does mm. um, there's also to be frank a, a clinging to claims and statistics in relation to the scale of civilian casualties which at the very least require a high level of skepticism because of where they're coming from and they've been criticised and called into question by all kinds of people at this point as well. And it's, uh, I think that quote in particular, the idea that it's a war against humanity, I mean, it's the precise opposite. I mean, what they're up against in the form of this genocidal cult is something totalitarian and murderous and no state, no country would be expected to coexist with it. 
so close to its own civilians after particularly after they showed what they were capable of just six months ago so the whilst of course you don't want to be um giving anyone a free pass just because they're your ally nor do you want to be whitewashing your own military indiscretions no, in the light of what's going not. on in israel, in israel and definitely in the gaza not. strip um it's quite clear who started this war why it's continuing to be fought and what is at stake here and yet i think increasingly people are losing sight of all of that so the Final topic that I want to talk to you about today is that of assisted dying, which is a discussion that regularly kind of bubbles up, um, most recently because of a column in The Times written by former Conservative MP Matthew Paris. Um, and he makes a slightly interesting argument, one that you don't often see for uh, assisted suicide and euthanasia. Um, and essentially what he lays out in this article is that um, Maybe it's not such a bad thing if people who are elderly or who are disabled or terminally ill, maybe it's not so bad if there is this kind of social pressure that sort of pushes them towards um, assisted dying. Uh, you know, we have a ever shrinking working age population uh, and these groups of people are increasingly an economic burden on us. So maybe it's not that bad if, you know, they decide to it in. I mean, he uses some quite brusque language in it as well, doesn't Does. he? I think you've got. I think you've got a quote there, but it's yeah. So I'll just read you a little. Read you a little um, quote from this. Our growing interest in assisted dying may reflect a largely unconscious realization that we are si that we simply cannot afford extreme senescence or desperate infirmity for as many such individuals as our society is producing. Your time is up will never be an order, but yes, the objectors are right, may one day be the kind of unspoken hint that everybody understands, and that's a good thing. There you go. <sighs> so from the horse's mouth. Mm. Wow. It's not often an argument that you see from the assisted dying camp, is it, Madeline? No, um, <laughs> no, it's not, because normally they don't say the quiet bit quite so loudly, do they? But actually, I, I think Matthew Paris is a wonderful columnist. I often disagree with him, but he genuinely doesn't care what anyone thinks about mm. him, which is a great quality because so many columnists are kind of swayed by, you know, a fashionable opinion. And, you know, I think he writes very beautifully. So he tends to give you a very eloquent example of whatever argument he's making. And he's put forward the coldly utilitarian logic of assisted dying, or at least in, in my view. Um, and he's put it, you know, they're out in the world for everyone to see. In a way, I'm I'm glad because it's always better to know exactly what you're what you're dealing with there. Um, the idea that people beyond a certain age or serve no societal purpose, so they basically should be bumped off. I mean, that's kind of that is the essence of it. Um, and it really one of this is one of the things that worries me very much about the prospect of it being legalised. It's reportedly something that the Labour Party want to, in, to want to bring in. They may have a very large majority soon. Um, yes, it's the kind of moral argument where if we have a big public debate on it, you know, people might people might change their minds as they're exposed to, for example, examples around the world, Canada, Netherlands, many places where it's been tried. The, the slippery slope is very visible in action. Um, so maybe, but you know, it's the kind of thing where I think well, this could very well be a a firm policy um, that is. Um, that is being implemented in this country very, very soon. So I think it's better to actually have the full truth in front of you. Yeah, Keir Starmer's quite interested in it as mm. well. Um, so that could be proof that it's, it's coming quite soon enough. I mean, it, it is interesting to see that that very utilitarian argument, as you say, laid out so brutally, because that's usually the one that they want to kind of <laughs> to shy away from. It becomes much more an argument about compassion, yes. about choice, not, um, you're no use to us anymore, so could you please um, do the right thing and allow us to bump you off, which was more or less the undertone of what he was he was saying there. It was interesting because he kind of starts off the column by saying, I think he re refers to Michael Foote, and he says, Michael Foote always used to say that, you know, you need to confront your opponent's best argument, not their worst argument, whatever. He doesn't really confront his opponent's best argument so much as he does vigorously agree with it to quite a gruesome <laughs> extent. But as you say, it was it was useful insofar as demonstrating what um, what's really kind of underneath that veneer of care, care and compassion and whatever. Because yeah. like Kevin Newell made this point on the website this week. He said, the, this is the thing about assisted suicide, which is what it is, assisted dying, these kind of euphemisms we use, yeah. um, is that you're creating kind of two categories of suicide. You're creating one that you're fine with, <laughs> one that you're like, you know what, it's probably about right. And another one that you try desperately to prevent. That's and so that creates two categories of human being. That creates, you know, the deserving and the undeserving. It's really grotesque. And there's a... There's a reason that um, throughout history, when people start to entertain these ideas, it can lead you down quite dark paths. And the point about the slippery slope, 
oh is clear beyond point now. I mean, Canada is a perfect example of this. Over the course of the past decade, it's gone from, which is always where it starts, terminally ill individuals, last months of life, no hope whatsoever, et cetera, to it's, it's been delayed now, but it's formally they're ex- about to extend it to people who are just mentally ill. And there's been horrendous cases of people accessing it purely really because they're down on their luck, like they're about to be kicked out of their house or something. But they also have some sort of chronic condition, which they can use as a pretext to claim what in that country is referred to as, as made. So it's, um, yeah, I mean, bring on the debate really, because of the fact that I think there are so many examples now of how quickly and how slick that slippery slope becomes that hopefully will be something that we can um It's something like, it's against. almost 5% of just all deaths in Canada now are caused by MAID. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I think that things in Britain could be just as bad. I mean, for many reasons. Like, there's already, I think we, we do have a feeling of, well, there's the, the, the sacralizing of the health service for a start. Um, you know, how many, how many times during lockdown were people asked to do the most, to destroy everything they hold dear in order to protect the NHS and they often did it. Um, I think we also have a, a quite an unbalanced economy where a lot of the, the national wealth is tied up in people's housing stock. Um, so I think the pressure on particularly older relatives, if, you know, and I know this sounds awful, but I'm not, I'm a pessimist. <laughs> I'm a conservative. I think conservatism is you have to be quite realistic about the limits of human nature. You, you shouldn't legislate for the best case scenario, but for the pot- pos- potentially the worst, there will be some people who might put pressure on, on their, on their relatives. And I know that sounds like an awful thing to say, but if you look at history, you see numerous examples of man's inhumanity to man. Um, whereas the, I think the pro- one problem I have with the arguments for assisted dying is that it usually is, it can be quite anecdotal. Mm-hmm. It tends to point, for example, someone, somebody like Esther Ranson, who's clearly a woman who extremely eloquent and um, makes her case exceptionally well. Um, and for, but for every Esther Ranson, and she clearly knows exactly what she wants, for every Esther Ranson, there will be many more people who we don't hear from who will be in a much more um, vulnerable position and might feel societal pressure. And even just the, the, the sea change, the crossing of the Rubicon that it would be, that we would say that these certain kinds of death now become kind of sanctioned by the state, that would be kind of crossing a moral line. Mm-hmm. I'm not really sure. It's hard to calculate what that might do in the psyches of, of people. If Absolutely. that makes sense. Absolutely. It creates his own pressure as well. It's not yeah. just about, you know, your nephew's getting slightly itchy feet about when he's going to inherit the house or whatever. It's just the fact that society, yeah. the state has made a, a profound statement that maybe your life isn't worth living. Maybe yeah. it's the kind thing. Maybe, I mean, in that Matthew Paris column, he even makes point, it's almost feel- just to do this, you know. It, how many older people already say, oh, I'm such a bur- burden, mm. I'm such a bother. It's something I've noticed older relatives in my family say a lot. And it's awful. It's sad when people say this to you because you—that's not how it feels when you're looking after someone, for example. But but if if people feel like this, and then the state is telling them that actually they were quite right to feel like that, what does that do? Mm. And and for the health service to become the sort of linchpin of this argument, as it is in the Paris column, is is so grotesque. I mean, I, I hate those arguments anyway. It was like you shouldn't smoke because of the NHS, or you shouldn't go outside yeah. because of the NHS. You know, now it's become protect the NHS. Have you thought about killing yourself? I mean, it's a horrendous sort of state of affairs. But also, it's I, th- I think there's something where it's an ex- it's an admission of a sort of tremendous failure. I mean, if you mm. this debate is going on in Scotland at the moment, where public services and health services is in a pretty sorry state as well, and there's something about. The part of the reason I think people are attracted to this as an option is because they don't really have any faith that, um, particularly if they live to a ripe old age, particularly if they've got some sort of chronic or fatal conditions, that their final days are going to be relatively comfortable, that they are going to be looked after in the right possible way. They just see constant news stories about how horrendous the health services are and how people aren't really being provided for. And you see pictures, as there have been in recent weeks, of kind of Scottish MSPs kind of waving placards saying 80% of my community in all you support assisted suicide you think maybe that's not the shining endorsement you think mm. that it is but um as you say this it does feel unfortunately that various western societies are just inevitably moving in this direction but i really hope that the the weight of evidence from where it's been tried will at least start to push back in the other direction as we start to have this debate a bit more thank you so much for watching the spikes podcast we'll be back next friday 
If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.